All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, what we see here is a, uh, it's a shorter chapter for sure than, than most of the other ones that we've dealt with. And there's one main theme to this, uh, to this chapter, and this is dealing with eating food that's offered unto idols. So if you remember in the previous chapter, it was talking about um, fornication and being married. And he, and he started off chapter 7 saying, Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for man not to touch a woman. Now in chapter 8, he says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, so he's changing subjects, a completely new thought, and it's, it's a, a new um, teaching here. He shifted gears into talking about things offered unto idols. He says, We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And this is, this one verse, verse 1 is the theme for the whole rest of this chapter. So keep that in mind. Now, this verse, I've preached this verse multiple times in the past. It's an important one that we all need to have sink down into our hearts. Knowledge puffeth up. It's common for people, the more you learn, to get more, and it doesn't matter what it's on, whether it's on the Bible, whether it's on you know, world history, current events, you know, whatever it is, whatever it is that you're just learning more about, the tendency is for people to get proud and to get lifted up because now all of a sudden you know so much more than other people. You have a knowledge that, that um, puffs you up and you think you're so smart. I know all this stuff that you guys don't know. And it makes you feel like you're better than them. And, and people can start to have that type of an attitude. And we need to be careful for that. But the way that you balance out your knowledge is through charity. Now, we'll get into charity when we do chapter 13, 1 Corinthians, because that's what the, this is the charity chapter is what it's all about. And ultimately, charity is a love where you're doing things for other people. And I just want to point this out. I'll, I'll, we'll jump straight down to the last verse in this chapter because everything else in between, I'm going to expound on all of that. But the first verse, he's saying, look, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And he goes through how we know that like the idol's nothing, that it's really just a, a stock. It's a piece of wood. It's a piece of metal. It's, it's nothing. It's not a god. So, hey, food is food. Who cares if it's, you know, whatever it is, we could just eat it. And, and you know, that's what this, this whole chapter is about. But look what it says in the last verse. It ties in with the first verse. He says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh, while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. What is this attitude that he has here? The attitude is, I am looking out for my brother in Christ way more than I care about whatever liberty I have to do this or to do that. He's saying... I, if it's going to cause somebody to offend, I'm just going to make sure I don't do it. He said, while the world stands, he said, I just won't eat any meat. If it's going to make that, if it's going to, if it's going to cause someone else to sin or cause problems, be a stumbling block for someone else. See, that's the charity. The charity is your concern about other people. You're not, you don't have this proud attitude. Well, I could do this anyways because, you know, I know that this is fine. This is good for me to do. Yeah, but it's cause, if it's causing your brother to offend, then it's a sin. And you don't have the right mindset and you're, you're having too much of a proud attitude of being puffed up in your knowledge. Now, a lot of people get puffed up in their knowledge just in general, especially when you start hearing hard preaching you know, you've never heard before. Maybe you're saved or newly saved and you start hearing all this stuff and you've been going to church for a long time. You're like, man, you know, these pastors, they don't know what they're talking about and all this other stuff. And they'll... they'll rail on even like Baptist pastors and people who are who have the right gospel and are 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 you know teaching the right salvation and they'll they'll start calling names to a bunch of people because they're getting puffed up after a few months of hearing good solid doctrine they get that little bit of knowledge and start thinking that they're so much smarter than everybody else you got to watch out for that and I'll tell you what when you try to when you when you approach somebody if you want to share, I mean, what, are you, what good is that knowledge going to do you by yourself anyways? The whole goal is to be able to share that with other people, right? Now, many people, as they get started hearing all this truth, they get a zeal. They want to tell other people all this stuff, but it's similar to what we were talking about before service, Brother Sebastian, how, you know, there's, there's definitely a way to approach people and to talk to them about it. You don't want to just have, just because you have all this knowledge, and the example we were talking about is, um, 
we're going to get to later in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when it talks about the length of your hair, right? It's easy to get puffed up and be like, oh man, these churches, they don't ever say anything about that. But like, you know, this is, a, and it, it's obvious, you know, women ought to have long hair, but then you see so many women these days having short hair. It's easy to get puffed up in that knowledge and to just use that in like attack mode. Well, you don't even have long hair and the Bible says that you need to have, you know, that's not the right way to approach people who you're trying to share knowledge with. There are times for rebuke, but normally those types of people that, that you're getting involved with, like sometimes they might not even be saved. What's the point of just railing on them about their hair length if they don't even have the gospel right? Or there's other things that are bigger. You know, you don't need to be, and you don't need to be approaching people with that type of an attitude of being puffed up and proud in the things that you know that maybe they've never even heard before. The best way to approach that topic, if you feel it's something that they need to know, which, I mean, it's in the Bible, it's important, you could say, hey, did you know, did, you know, what do you think about this scripture? You can do so in a tactful way where you're not just lifted up in yourself because of the knowledge, the new knowledge now that you possess. So in order to balance it out, the charity is what you need. It's the love for other people. It's a, it's a concern and the care for other people where you use that knowledge appropriately. So even if you're in, in this chapter is dealing specifically with eating food sacrificed unto idols. You don't want to give a false impression. And I've got a good uh, analogy for this. When I went for, for my friend's funeral, I had someone approach me and they asked me if it was wrong to take communion in the Catholic Church. Because she said, well, I wanted, you know, I wanted to do it. It's just something, because she, I guess, grew up Catholic or whatever. And since then, she, she doesn't believe the Catholic Church teaching on a lot of things. And she gave all the right answers for salvation. But she's like, yeah, but it's something that I just, I like to go back there and take communion. And my answer to her was, first, I was kind of explaining, like the apostle was, well, if you do it, I mean, it's just a wafer. Like, the Catholics believe that it's literally becoming the body of Jesus Christ, like, in your mouth, like you're eating the flesh of Christ, which is totally bizarre and weird and wrong and false and wicked. That's not right. But if you eat it, you're just eating a wafer or whatever, right? Like, like that in and of itself, you're just consuming some food. So there's nothing wrong with, with, with that, right? That's not sin. But the problem is, now you're going to be condoning. If someone sees you and says, well, they don't believe what the Catholic Church is, but they're going to have a communion with the Catholic Church. You're, 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 you could cause other people to offend and say, oh, well, maybe there's some truth to this. Maybe there's some goodness to this, you know, when there's really nothing good in that. And there's no reason to participate in that and to yoke up and to join up with the Catholic Church, which teaches a works-based salvation, which is sending people to hell. And I said this to her too. I said, look, I draw the line of having any participation with people when they teach a false gospel. I said, that is a long line. I will not, you know, I'm not going to participate and even show what might be perceived as my approval of this church by participating in their events and participating in their rituals or whatever it may be when they're sending people to hell. And this chapter, I believe, answers that question very, very aptly because, um, Okay, maybe they're not sacrificing it or, or offering it specifically to an idol, but they do have the idol of, of the dead Jesus Christ hanging on the cross, like right in full view, the Catholic Church I was at for the funeral, that, by the way, I was able to speak at and preach truth at, which is one of the reasons why I was there anyways. But the big idol that they have, in a way, that is offered in sacrifice to their idol, because they've raised up an idol of Jesus Christ that's not real. The Jesus Christ they believe in is not the Jesus Christ of the Bible. There's many aspects that they believe that are true, but ultimately, they don't believe that he was the Savior of the world and the only true Savior and the only way to God, and that the, he's the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And they lift up this idol. So, when you eat and drink, you could, in a sense, you, you are eating and drinking food that was offered for idols. That which is sacrificed to idols. But let's keep reading here. Verse number two, And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Keep a humble attitude in your knowledge. 
Don't get so proud, you know, with the knowledge that you do gain. Don't all of a sudden think that you know it all. It's a bad attitude. You know, we get this a lot out soul winning. We talk to people, well, can I do, you know, we ask them if they know for sure they're going to heaven. They might answer no or yes, and then they'll give you the wrong answer. And then we'll be like, well, hey, can we, can we show you from the Bible what, what it takes to be saved? And so many times, oh, I've read the whole Bible. I know what the Bible says. I know everything the Bible says. And that always blows me. I know everything the Bible says. You know everything the Bible says? Really? Can you just start reciting the Bible to me? Start, how about First Chronicles? You just start reciting First Chronicles to me. Because I know you know everything the Bible says. And these people that say that probably have never read the whole Bible cover to cover one time. But they have this, this attitude. And it's pride. Whatever knowledge they have, they've been lifted up and they think that they just know, oh, I know, I know. Look, I went to, to Catholic school. I went to, you know, whatever church for so all these years. I know what the Bible says. You know what you've been taught, someone else saying what the Bible says. You don't know what the Bible says because if you did, you know at least what salvation is and what it takes to be saved. But people have that type of an attitude. And it's not just for the unsaved. It's not just for the people at the doors. Hey, we need to know in ourselves, don't get so comfortable in thinking that you just know the Bible so well and you just know everything about the Bible. He says, you know, if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. I'm constantly learning from the Bible. I would never make such a bold statement. Like, I just know everything there is, even about like a chapter of the Bible. I just know everything about that chapter because I don't. God's word is infinitely deep and there's always things to be learned. And, um, you know, the Bible's trying to get that home, that, that point home of the humility here in verse 2. Now look at verse number 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. So he's saying, look, we know. This is the knowledge that we possess. We know an idol is really nothing. We know that that graven image, whatever it is that, that was carved and molten, that somebody has set up as a god, we know that that's nothing. We have no respect for that. If I were to walk into some temple and people have built up this big shrine and there's this golden little Buddha or whatever sitting there, I would take the stupid thing up and whip it against the wall and break its head off and not care one bit about it because it's not a God. It's not going, it has no power. It can't do anything to me. I would have no fears about that. Well, well maybe, maybe there is some power. No. Because we know that there's one God. We know that God is real and that he's not embodied in some idol. Other people do believe that, that God somehow is, is manifested in these idols or whatever. But we know that God does not exist in an idol, that the idol is nothing, that it literally is nothing. It's just, it's just an object. It's metal that's been formed. I mean, we have all kinds of metal. We have to drive a metal vehicle. It's not a God any more than the, than the one that has a shrine built around it is. That's what we know. But look at verse number five. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. He says, look, there are many that are called gods. I mean, look at Greek mythology and, and, and you know, all the, the various gods in, the, in, the, in, the, just in previous religions throughout history. You have Zeus and Thor and all, you know, all these other gods. And there are many, many, many gods, the little g gods, like the Bible uses here, the little g gods. There's many that are called gods. But to us, there's but one God. Because it's the truth. There is one God, the Father um, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to be aware of this real briefly, just as we're on this verse, as a, as a sidetrack from the main uh, subject matter, is that I want you to be aware of the Mormon doctrine of many gods. The Mormons believe that ultimately, godhood can be achieved by 
human beings that you can, if you are a good enough Mormon and you do all the right things and you know all the secret handshakes and you're part of the secret society and you do, you know, you make it to the highest level of Mormonism and you wear the, the, the special underwear and you do all these things. And you know, I know it sounds ridiculous, but <laughs> it's the truth. This is what they believe, that one day you will be a god of your own planet and you'll have multiple wives and you will have spirit babies that will populate your own planet that you are the god of. Now, when you try to confront a Mormon with this doctrine, they will first deny it. They'll lie to your face. Oh, we don't believe that. That's crazy. Of course we don't believe that. If you could get someone to talk to you long enough and finally admit, well, yeah... And what, before they even get to that point where they'll admit it, they'll say, well, to us, there's one God. And I've heard this quoted many times before. Well, to us, there's, there's one God. And what they're doing is they're quoting this verse. So they're justifying their belief in multiple gods while saying, well, even though there's many gods out there, even in Jesus' day and in the apostles' day, they're say, he's saying, but to us, there is but one God. And they'll use verses like this. See, there's many that are called God. There's many gods. And they'll use these verses to justify it. But obviously, um, if anyone did try to bring you here to prove it, it's very easy. Just always, always, always. And, and whenever you're dealing with any of these cults or people believe in weird doctrines, always read things in context. Don't let them jump around on you. Because what they like to do is throw this verse at you, and then while you're looking at the verse, especially if you're not really familiar with it, and you're trying to say, wait a minute, what does this say? Because you're, you're trying to comprehend how in the world they're coming up with this weird belief out of this, and you start to read the context, they'll throw another one at you and try to distract you into never really getting the, the full meaning of what it's saying there. Don't let them do that. Go into context and be like, that's not what this is talking about at all. This is all about food being sacrificed unto, unto gods that people are calling gods, but they're not real gods. We know that there's no real gods. We know that there's only one God. And it's not just because we're on this planet and there's only one God of this planet and other planets have other gods. It's because there's only one God, creator of heaven and earth, and, and everything that is therein, the whole heaven, everything, every planet. God created everything. He's not just the God of this one planet. Flip over, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 43. Keep your finger here. We'll come right back. But Isaiah 43 is an excellent place to, to show the Mormon. Isaiah 43 and Isaiah 45 are great for Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses. They prove the deity of Jesus Christ. And here... If you can actually get someone, a Mormon, to believe in multiple gods, look at Isaiah 43, verse number 10. Isaiah 43, 10 reads, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Unequivocal statement from the Bible that cannot be yanked out of context saying, look, I am the Lord. I am God. Before me, there was no God created. It didn't exist. There was no other God. Neither after me shall there be any other God. Look, there is no other God. He's saying this before, after. I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me, there is no Savior. So that's it. I am God. There are no other gods. There's one God. And there's many other places that prove that. But this, this verse in particular is one of my favorites that, that talk about that. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I just want you to see that because it's important to have this type of knowledge when you're out soul winning so that you can show why their belief is wrong. I never expect people to believe the things that I say just because I say them. When we go out soul winning, that's why we always have our Bibles in our hands. I bring the Old Testament and the New Testament. I bring the whole, but this, this is actually the Bible that I bring out with me soul winning. I don't just bring a New Testament. Now, if you go out soul winning, you bring a New Testament, am I going to be down on you? No. But I like to have, in case, just in case, I get into a conversation with someone where there are verses in the Old Testament that are very clear about this, and I want to be able to prove something from the Bible. Hey, 
You've got the whole Bible to work with, not just the New Testament. Isaiah 9, 6. I mean, there, there's so many places that have great verses. And also verses that are not as corrupted in some of the false versions, like the Jehovah's False Witness version, the New World Translation. Um, in the Old Testament, you, can, you could see that they're basically saying the same thing. They haven't been corrupted in certain areas when you're proving a point like deity of Jesus Christ or whatever. So I like to be able to show people why. And then if they don't receive it, you know, you know after the first and second admonition, you know, the Bible says to reject them and, uh, and move on. But I like to have it at my fingertips. I like to show people this is where it's at. So if you like to mark down verses, and if you're unfamiliar with them, for uh, Isaiah 43, um, for, the, for the cults that believe in multiple gods, like Mormonism, uh, is a great place. Verses 10 and 11 are great places to go to. Let's continue on here in 1 Corinthians 8, though, regarding food that's offered and sacrificed unto idol. We know that there's, there's but one God. We know that these gods are nothing. These idols are nothing. Verse number 7, Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. So he's saying, look, we know that there's no other. We know that these gods are nothing. But not everybody knows that. Not everybody knows what we know. There's still people out there to this day that are eating food as if it's sacrificed unto a God, you know, and they're believing in that. There are Catholics out there today that are eating their wafer and believing that it's Jesus Christ's body being transfigured in their mouth when they're eating. There are Catholics that believe that. It's being done today. Their conscience being weak is defiled. It's a sin. Verse number 8, But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. So he's saying, look, the food isn't what commends us to God. That's not what makes us right with God. He says, neither if we eat are we the better. If we eat the food, it doesn't make us any better. And if we eat not, we're not the worst. It does, it's not bad for us not to eat this food. So he's saying, now look, and I want to pause here. We're going we're to actually go to chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 10 is a, is a long book, so I'm not worried about this. We're going to cover, though, uh, quite a bit on this subject. Because some people will take this chapter or this verse and they'll try to teach that it's actually not a sin to eat food sacrificed to idols. And I don't believe that to be true. And it's not just because it could make your brother to offend. Because they'll say, well, what if there's nobody that sees me? Then is it still a sin? Yes, it is. Some people say, well, it's not because, you know, the idol's nothing. But it is still a sin to eat food that has been sacrificed unto idols. Flip over to, to chapter 10, if you were to look at verse number 19. Verse number 19. What say I then? That the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. So what he's saying here is, you know what? What's being offered in, as a sacrifice unto these idols, it's actually not even being offered unto idols. It's being offered unto a devil. A devil is a fallen angel of God. There are these names of these idols and these false gods that people would worship are literally names, I believe, of, of devils and people that like to receive worship. And it makes sense. I mean, what is Satan himself? He wants to be worshipped as God. When the Antichrist comes into power and he sets up his throne, he's going to set up in the temple that, that he is God. And he's going to want everyone to worship him. They're all going to, he's going to make everyone take the mark and worship him. He wants worship as just as people worship God. That's his desire. And the devils, they want worship also. They manifest themselves. I believe they manifested themselves in, in times past unto certain people who believe that they were from God when they're really just a devil. And people sacrifice and create whole religions and false religions based on what some false prophets have seen in these visions. 
That's why Galatians 1, the Bible says, But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that you have received, let him be accursed. There are these, you know, like the uh, Joseph Smith, right? He claims to have gotten the Book of Mormon from an angel. He claims to have had these visions. Now, he may have had a vision, but the vision he had was not a godly one. It was one with the devil. The prophet Muhammad of Islam, same thing. He had visions where he even thought it was the devil. He thought it was satanic at first. And it was. Because the guy was a pedophile and, and twisted and corrupted and, and screwed up. And, uh, and it was of Satan. It's a satanic religion. He had these visions. But they had visions of people preaching another gospel. And they're these false gods, these devils. They're not just, just inanimate idols. They're actually devils that were being, having food sacrificed unto them or whatever. And that's what he's explaining here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He's saying, look, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils. Because the idol is representative of some devil. He says, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. He's saying you shouldn't be, be eating food you know, and taking a fellowship with devils. That alone is a sin. It has nothing to do that alone has nothing to do with whether or not your brother sees you doing that. He's saying, I don't want you participating with that. Deuteronomy chapter 32. I'll just read this for you. Deuteronomy 32 verse 16 says, They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God. To gods, lowercase g, whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten God that formed thee. And when the Lord saw it, he abhorred them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. So this is talking about when the people back in the Old Testament were saying, look, they sacrificed unto devils. Their idols that they set up were devils. And they provoked God to jealousy because God is a jealous God. Look, God doesn't want our attention and our affection and our respect going unto a devil, going unto something that's called a God but is not really God himself. That makes God angry. It makes him jealous. He said, look, I'm the one that created you and I want your attention and I demand your respect. Don't be given what belongs unto me, unto some devil, unto some idol, unto some false God. So I'm the creator, you worship and serve me. That's why the first two commandments have to do with not making idols, not bowing down to them, and having no God before God. Because those are the most important things for him, is that you worship me. And all throughout the Old Testament, when the children of Israel are judged, it's always a result of them turning to other gods. Always. Even in Romans 1, when people become reprobate, it's because... They knew God, they glorified Him not as God, and they, they, served, they worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. The ultimate result of, of you know, these sins is when you turn away from God, God's judgment is coming for sure. And it's just a matter of time. You know, this, this country is fading fast. The morality is going down the tubes. I preach on this so many times. The false religions are going to get bigger, and that's why, you know, the, the, the fundamental Christians, the, the people who believe the Bible and God's Word, seem to be getting less and less now that we have a resurgence, praise the Lord, of people who believe the Bible and are ruling to shout it from the housetops. But I believe that just in general, what's going to happen in this country is that whether it be Islam, because you see the acceptance of Islam now, it's becoming sickening. The way that our political leaders, the way it's being politicized, and, and, the, and the, the, the programming from the television, the media, the brainwashing that's going on, and they're telling people, you need to accept this, and, and elevating the status of the Muslim religion above Christianity, and saying, well, you need to accept this. We're going to get rid of Christian prayers in the schools, but we're going to allow for the Muslim prayers. We're going to make special reparations and we're going we're gonna to do things and go out of our way. And when that happened, when, when, when Christianity is completely replaced in this country, that is when God's judgment is going to come.
The Bible says here, I read for you in Deuteronomy 32, it says that when the Lord saw it, he abhorred, he hated them. Abhor is such a strong word. It's not just hating, it's a strong hate. Abhorring somebody is a, is a strong hatred. He abhorred them. Who? The people. He abhorred the people that were worshiping and serving these idols. And they set up their false gods. He hated them because of the provoking of his sons and of his daughters. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm going to continue reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 21. Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? So he's saying, look, just like he said in Deuteronomy, look, we don't want to provoke God to jealousy. We don't want to get caught up in eating and sitting down and eating food that's sacrificed unto idols because now we're being partaker in a table of devils. And I don't want to provoke God to jealousy by me doing that. Can you imagine what God would think of me? A believer in Jesus Christ, at, when I was at that funeral, if I were to just stand up and partake of the communion that was given in that Catholic church. That would ruin my testimony and that would bring a bad name. I mean, not only would people looking at that, God himself would be angry. He said, you know that, there's, that that's, not what, that's not right what they're doing there. You know that that's false. What are you doing partaking at the table of devils? Verse number 23. And this is important to understand this. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Again, we're going back to the concept of having knowledge, but not being puffed up in that knowledge by having charity. So... He's saying, look, because I'm free in Christ, because Christ has paid for every single one of my sins, I am not bound by the law. All things are lawful unto me. I can go, ahead, I can go and, and eat food sacrificed unto idols. Because the, the idol is nothing, and it's just food. And I have this knowledge. I know that that devil isn't real, or that idol isn't real. I know that's not real. And Christ has paid for all of my sins, so I can go and, and, and do that. He says, but all things are not expedient. He says, all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. What's edifying? Not to me, but to other people. That doesn't help anybody out at all by me going and partaking in the food sacrifice unto idols. Verse number 24, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Again, the same concept being hammered home. Look, don't worry about your own wealth. Worry about other people. In everything that you do, worry about other people. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Now that word shambles, it's an old word, and people like to throw this out, this verse out, and saying, see, the King James is so, you know, corrupted, or not corrupted, but uh, it's so outdated, and people don't even know what that word means. Look, there are a few words in the Bible that aren't really commonly used today that maybe a lot of people don't know, but... It doesn't take much to figure out what these words mean or to look them up. I mean, even from the context, you can look at that and be like, well, he's been talking about eating food. And it says here, go ahead and eat. So food that's sold in the shambles, you might think of shambles now as maybe like a real rundown, like broken down house or something as being in shambles. But the shambles is just like the butcher, okay? It's not, it's not... It's not complicated. It's an easy board. You can look it up in the dictionary and still give you the right definition. It hasn't changed meanings. It's just not commonly used today. He says, whatsoever is sold in the shambles, that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. He says, look, when you go and buy food, and this isn't as common anymore, but you know, people of different religions would be maybe blessing their food to their idols and the stuff that even if they were a merchant and they were selling food, right? And uh, well, think about today, even the, the kosher foods, I think the, the like meat, if it's kosher, has been prepared a certain way by the Jews that still want to practice their stupid, vain traditions of man, which I don't even think they follow the Bible way, but the way that they, they butcher an animal 
it's kosher if they do follow a certain procedure. Now, I'm not an expert now. I don't know all the details of that. But I do know that they stamp their food. And what he's saying is, look, when you go to get food, you don't have to ask all these questions. Where did it come from? It's like when you go to a store, you don't have to start asking, well, do you support homosexual marriage? Do you, do, you know, do you support Planned Parenthood? Do you, you know, and just find out all the little details that are sins about them. You don't have to like ask all these things. He says, for conscience sake, just go ahead and just... Whatsoever sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Because you don't want to start being like, oh man, maybe I shouldn't do this. Don't worry about it. It's just food. If you don't know, fine. He says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. So again, if you're invited to a feast, someone's throwing a party, sit down, whatever they serve up to you as food, Go ahead and eat that. You want to go to a party? You got a friend throw a party or someone you know? Great. Sit down and eat the food. You don't have to start asking questions. Did you offer this as sacrifice to, to, to an idol? You don't have to ask that question. Just go and eat. But look what he says in verse 28. But if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, eat not for his sake that showed it and for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So he's saying, okay, now, you don't ask, just, just whatever you get eat, but if someone makes a point and they say, hey, by the way, this was sacrificed unto idols, that's the moment you say no. Can't do it. Sorry. I cannot eat this food that's sacrificed unto idols. And you make that stand. And it says in verse 29, conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? He said, look, I know I'm at liberty to do this if I wanted to, but I'm worried about this person. And again, the whole attitude was being concerned with other people. If, well, you know, if I eat, it, might, it makes my brother to offend, I won't eat meat at all. He said, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to offend this person. Verse 30, for if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for, for that for which I give thanks? Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Let's go back to chapter 8. So we could see, when you put chapter 8 and chapter 10 together, with the food sacrifice on the idols, the primary application is that we need to be concerned with other people. We need to be concerned with their beliefs and what they think, and you know, be considerate of that and not cause other people to sin. And the way that will cause them to sin is because if he tells you, hey, by the way, this was sacrificed unto idols, and you're like, well, an idol is nothing and just in your head, and you just know that in your heart, and you just go ahead and eat anyway, that guy's going to see you, and that is going to make more of an impact on him than any of the words that come out of your mouth. He's going to see, okay, here's someone who's a Christian. He professes the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows that I've just offered this, dedicated this unto this idol, and he's partaken of it. It must not be that bad then, the Christian, you know, like, what I'm doing is okay. Nothing wrong with it. It's just fine. You're, you're affirming their actions that are sinful in and of themselves anyways, because they're partaking with the table of devils. And you're just saying, yep, I'm going to partake with you. We need to be able to take those stands. There are stands that I've taken, you know, get invited to a baptism, for example, like a, ba a baby sprinkling. I won't attend that. I'm not going to show support for something that I don't think is biblical. People want to go to a, a communion. The first communion, right? The first holy communion of a, how old are they? Six, seven, eight years old, somewhere around there? Second grade, yeah. Seven, eight years old, somewhere in that time frame, or whatever. You know, they're all excited. They think it's a really good thing, and they, oh, he's religious. Why don't you? Cut? No. Now, I always do so tactfully, and I, and I actually, it's a great opportunity to try to bring up, you know, why it's not scriptural, and and maybe bring up the gospel. It's it's an excellent opportunity for that, but I do not endorse that behavior or that activity, so I don't go and be a part of that. And, you know, I know that this chapter is specifically talking about food offered unto idols, 
But we can apply this, I think, broadly to other aspects where people are doing rituals or, or, or things of that nature where it's um, just completely unbiblical and not right. And not only is it, is it maybe a little bit off, there's just some things that people can do that are just, you can say, well, that's not scriptural, but it's not necessarily a sin. Eating food sacrificed on idols is a sin. So you'll have to take that and, and decide for yourself your own rules on, on how much you can, you can be seen at, say, for example, like a baptism, a baby baptism or something. Maybe someone goes to that with the intent of just preaching the gospel because they're going to say, hey, there's a great opportunity, and if I go, I can talk to people about this. You know, whatever. The Bible doesn't say that if you are in attendance that you are just in sin. I'm explaining the position that I take and, and for this reason. This is my, my personal um, conviction on this. It's not, you know, it's not a, a law. But I think we can apply the, the spirit of this law in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 to other aspects and, and use that because we don't want to offend our brothers in Christ and offend them by, by um, not by saying, oh, I'm not going to do that, but by making them to stumble by showing your approval and making them think that everything's okay with that. Because that, that actually does worse. A perfect example, I saw I was at a, a luncheon and there was this priest present there and they were doing all these shots. It was actually a celebration luncheon for a baptism. And the priest took a shot of alcohol with a bunch of other people and I overheard this guy I knew say, well, if the man of God's doing it, I guess I can do it too. That is a perfect example of what this chapter is talking about. He sees this so-called man of God taking a shot of liquor, booze, and, well, it must not be that bad if he's doing it. Well, you need to keep that in mind when you say, oh, yeah, but, well, I'm at liberty, right? I'm in Christ. Look, don't cause other people to offend. Now, again, drinking alcohol, I believe, is a sin. And I, I don't have, I'm not going to get into that tonight. I've preached other sermons, multiple sermons on that subject, that that alone is a sin anyways. It's not for, not just because you might cause someone else to offend, but hey, add that to the list of reasons why it's a sin to drink alcohol. Not just because it's poison and it's going to cause your, your eyes to behold strange women, your heart to utter perverse things. That is a reason enough. But also because other people are going to be looking at you and saying, oh, well, Pastor Berzins, you know, he's a Baptist pastor and he's having a beer, so it must be okay for me. And they're an alcoholic. And they're a drunk or whatever. And you're going to cause them to say, well, drinking's not that bad. What it is. Just as eating things sacrificed on idols is a sin. Let's keep reading here in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Look at verse number 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. And that's exactly what I was just expounding upon is that they're going to be emboldened. That's going to make them braver to do something where at first they might have been a little bit uneasy. Like, well, I know there's some people that think drinking alcohol is a sin or whatever, you know. And then they see, oh, well, he's doing it. Boom. Now I'm emboldened to just go and do more, um, eat, you know, to do those things that are not right. And he's saying, just because you have this knowledge that you know the idol's nothing, should your brother perish because of that? You're going to cause your brother to be in even more sin and even to die, potentially, for whom Christ died. You're going to make it a lot harder for that person to get saved when you're condoning of this type of uh, behavior. Flip over, if you would, to Romans chapter 14. I'm going to try to get through this a little quickly. I, I, um, I spend a little bit more time 
getting up to this point than I had planned, but that's fine. Romans 14, this entire chapter of Romans 14 goes perfectly with 1 Corinthians 8 and the latter portion of 1 Corinthians 10. Everything that we've just read. It's the same concepts. And this is brought up, I'm bringing this up because I want you to see these various places where this topic is brought up. Because it's important doctrine. It's important to understand this. Now you may say, oh yeah, but there's really no you know, people sacrificing unto idols today. Maybe not necessarily in the same way that they did here, but there's definitely idolatry going on today. I mentioned already the Catholic Church and their Eucharist, but also, you know, there's other people that, that have their own idols and they're, that they're partaking in. And it's, it's important to be aware of that stuff. It's important to be aware of the things that you do and don't blow off the way that you walk, your walk with, with God and the way that you live your life as saying, well, I'm just free in Christ, so whatever. You know, I know, I know that this is nothing. I know that that's nothing. When other people consider it to be more important than it is or they elevate uh, sin or whatever and you partake in that, you're doing damage unto them. Romans 14, look at verse number 1. Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So this is right off the bat it explains who's right and who's wrong in this situation. He that's weak in the faith, he's saying, look, you need to receive that person. Your brother in Christ, they're weak in the faith. They have the faith, but they're real weak in the faith. They don't understand. They don't know. And, you know, you don't need to get into these doubtful disputations and arguments with them. They're just weak in the faith. You need to be a brother there to help edify them, right? Strengthen them. Build them up in the faith. For one believe it that he made all things, which is right, it's true, it's biblical. Hey, we could eat whatever. But another who is weak, the weak Christian, the weak, the person who is weak in their faith, eateth herbs. So they don't eat me. They only eat, they only eat, they're a vegetarian, Right? So he's saying, look, don't despise him that doesn't eat meat. Don't, you know, don't look down on him. Fine, go ahead. Eat, you know, it's, not, it's not a big deal. And he's saying, likewise, a person who doesn't eat meat, hey, don't despise the people that eat meat either. That's, that's your choice. But don't, uh, you know, you're, it's wrong to condemn the other person for that because it's their preference. Who art thou that judges another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. Verse 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, and another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord, he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not and giveth God thanks. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and living. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And this is talking about, you know, these things that really don't matter that much. This brought up, you know, elevating one day above another. You may be celebrating certain holidays or not celebrating holidays. Worshiping on Saturday versus on Sunday or whatever. And also being a vegetarian versus not. This specifically isn't talking about things that are sacrificed unto idols. In what we've read so far. But it's the same spirit of, look, we don't want to offend our brother. We don't need to rail him. Look, God's going to judge them. You know, let God determine the, you know, the judgment for them. We should be there to strengthen them in their faith. Everyone's going to give account of themselves. Look at verse number 13, though. Let us not, therefore, judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. This is what 1 Corinthians 8 is talking about. We don't want to set up something that's going to make our brother fall. Even if you believe it's right and it's not a problem to eat food, sacrifice on idols, you're saying that is placing a stumbling block before someone who's weak. 
And they think this is okay. The very person that, that I was talking about earlier that, that is probably saved, but she's real weak in the faith. Right? She's very, she doesn't, doesn't have a lot of knowledge. She's weak in the faith. If she were to see then me participate in something like that, that's going to embolden her to do more. And that's putting a stumbling block in front of her. And you say, well, I just ate because I'm hungry. And I just needed some food and whatever. You know, like it was here. I'm not eating it because I'm, you know, think that it's anything special. I'm just eating because I'm hungry. But that's putting a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in your brother's way. Verse 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. So he said, look, I know that nothing, like, like I said, the wafer at the Catholic communion, it's not unclean of itself. It's just a, it's just a wafer. You know, that's, it just is what it is. It's like, a, it's like the food that's, at, you know, offered and sacrificed on an idol. It's a, you know, a bull or, you know, a cow, whatever. You're eating beef. Like, it's just beef. It's not unclean of itself. But if you think that it's unclean, then it is unclean is what he's teaching here. He's saying if you think that it's wrong for you, like, like people today that believe that you, you can't, you know, some of the Old Testament laws are still in effect of, of the dietary laws, like eating shrimp and eating these other foods. If you think that that's a sin and you eat it, it is a sin unto you. Even though it's not really a sin. Even though God has lifted that dietary restriction and he says, look, what God has cleansed, that call not, not thou unclean. And he used the unclean animals to represent the Gentiles, but it was still a lifting of that because it was fulfilled as the gospel was being spread out and preached unto the Gentiles. Verse number 14, I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Again, remember we were talking about being charitable. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. If thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. If there's a weak Christian that believes, oh, I can't eat shrimp, you don't need to go now and rub it in their face. I'm just going to eat this shrimp now. You don't need to offend them. Now, Look what it says, uh, Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Verse 16, Let not then your good be evil spoken of, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Ultimately, the food doesn't matter. Right? And you should just be able to recognize that and say, look, if someone else has this major problem with this stuff, they're weak, fine, I'm not going to go out of my way to offend them. I'm not going to put a stumbling block before them. I'm not going to do these things because I care about them and I want them to grow and I want to see them continue to grow and you know and you could you could minister to them the way that they need it in order to grow. Verse 18 for he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable of God to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Same concept talking about edifying other people. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. And look, it is, it's true. All food is, you know, all things are pure unto him that is pure, but, but if you eat with offense, if you think it's wrong or if you doubt, then it's wrong because now you're not doing things of faith. Verse number 21, It is good neither to eat flesh nor to drink wine nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth or is offended or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat because he eateth not of faith for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And let that sink home. If you ever think that something might be a sin, and maybe you're just not even sure, well, I think this might be a sin, and you do it anyways, it's definitely a sin. Even if the thing that you do is not really a sin, if you start to think or even doubt, well, I don't know, this might be a sin, but then you just do it anyways, you have just sinned because you have just taken that, that, that doubt and said, oh, I don't know, you didn't act on faith on that 
of just saying, well, I just won't do it then. Because if I think this is wrong, then I shouldn't do it. I'm going to respect God's commandment. If that's what you think, if you think that God's commandment might be not to do something, then just don't do it. Because when you do it, all of a sudden, now you're in sin. 1 Corinthians 8, let's finish up the chapter. I'm going to reread verse number 11. And through thy knowledge shall the, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. So just because you have this knowledge and you think everything's just fine, there's no problem eating food sacrificed on idols. Now, because of that knowledge, should you just let your, your weak brother die? Verse number 12. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Say, when you, when you do that to another person, when you sin against that person because you're causing a stumbling block to be put in front of them, you're not just sinning against them, you're sinning against Christ. So it definitely is a sin to be doing those types of things, to be putting stumbling blocks in your, in your brother's path and to be you know, eating things off or sacrifice on or whatever it may be that's going to cause your weak brother in Christ to stumble. Verse 13, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Because that's what ultimately matters. You're cared, you, you should be cared, caring more about your brothers and sisters in Christ and about other people than yourself. If it's going to cause your brother to, to, even though you know, hey, there's nothing wrong with this, if you're going to cause your brother to stumble, he's saying, don't do it. Don't put a stumbling block in front of him. He's saying, I don't care. If, if it's something I even really enjoy, but if it's going to make it so that I'm not going to be causing my brother to stumble, then I just won't, I won't eat it. It's fine. No big deal. Because I care more about my brother in Christ than I care about whatever this food is. Let's bow our eyes word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the great teaching of the Bible. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us have humility as we learn more from your word. Dear God, help us not to be puffed up, but to, that we balance out our knowledge by being charitable and by, by using that knowledge to care for other people and to, to go out and witness other people and to, to bring your, your gospel and to shine the light, dear Lord, and to preach the truth. And that we do so charitably and love for other people, dear Lord. And that we would be conscious of the things that we do. And be careful not to cause our brothers and sisters in Christ to offend them, dear Lord, with the things that we are doing. And that we would um, try to hold ourselves to a high standard, even if some of the things that we would refrain from are not actually sins. If it's going to cause someone else to... Um, to stumble, dear Lord, help us just to hold ourselves to a higher standard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.